This week, the moon will fly through Earth's shadow and turn blood red for many hours. Here are the details. NASA reports that the longest partial lunar eclipse in 580 years will take place this week. The near total eclipse will happen between November 18th and 19th, while the moon is full and the Earth moves between the moon and the sun, causing the Earth's shadow to fall on the moon for almost three and a half hours. The shadow will block most of the light from the sun, bathing the moon in a dramatic red color. This dramatic reddening of the moon happens because light from the sun, despite being blocked by Earth, bends around our planet and travels through our atmosphere to reach the moon. Earth's atmosphere filters out shorter, bluer wavelengths of light and allows redder wavelengths through. After these red wavelengths pass through our atmosphere, they continue traveling to the moon, bathing it in red light. The eclipse will be visible from North America and the Pacific Ocean, Alaska, Western Europe, Eastern Australia, New Zealand, and Japan. To get exact eclipse timings for your location, you can visit websites like timeanddate.com. NASA calls this the eclipse of the microbeaver full moon. The microbeaver full moon is so named because it occurs when the moon is at its farthest point from Earth at a time when the beaver trapping season is about to start. Chances to see a total solar eclipse are rare, but in 2024, North Americans will be granted the perfect opportunity to do just that. Here's where you need to be to get the best view. The next total solar eclipse will occur over parts of North America on Monday, April 8, 2024. A solar eclipse occurs during a new moon when the moon passes directly between the Earth and the Sun. As the moon passes between the Earth and the Sun, it casts a full shadow on some parts of the planet and a partial shadow on a wider region. The new moons occur 13 times a year, but we don't see 13 solar eclipses in a year. This is because the moon's orbit tilts 5 degrees off the Earth's orbit around the Sun. Once we account for its tilted orbit, the moon is only perfectly aligned between the Earth and the Sun twice a year. According to NASA, in April of 2024, this effect will be experienced across North America from northern Mexico through parts of 15 U.S. states. The maximum duration of totality, the longest period of time when a full shadow is cast over the Earth, will be experienced over San Martin, north of Torreon, Mexico. Altogether, a total eclipse will be visible on a path of totality that is 200 kilometers wide. This means that cities including Dallas, Indianapolis, Cleveland, and Montreal will all experience total eclipse. Farther out, Los Angeles, Monterey, Toronto, and New York will all experience partial eclipse. So we might not know what else will be happening in 2024, maybe aliens will have taken over the planet. And okay, maybe they won't. But we do know one thing. On April 8th, if you get down to that corridor of North America, you can see the strange spectacle of the sun disappearing for a few minutes in the middle of the day. If you do go to check out the eclipse though, make sure to do it safely. Stick around now for one woman's unfortunate experience with an eclipse and, crucially, how you can avoid the same plight. Many scientists believe that the moon formed when a Mars-sized planet called Theia struck Earth around 4.5 billion years ago. Now, a team of scientists theorize that Theia's remains are what formed two mysterious continent-sized blobs of rock buried deep in Earth's mantle. For decades, seismologists have puzzled over these two blobs, which sit below West Africa and the Pacific Ocean and straddle Earth's core like a pair of headphones. Up to 1,000 kilometers tall and several times that wide, they are the largest thing in Earth's mantle, says Qian Yuan, a PhD student in geodynamics at Arizona State University. Seismic waves from earthquakes abruptly slow down when they pass through the layers, which suggests they are denser and chemically different from the surrounding mantle rock. These blobs might simply have crystallized out of the depths of Earth's primordial magma ocean. But based on new isotopic evidence and modeling, Yuan believes the blobs are the guts of the theoretical alien impactor planet. The study is currently under review. The story behind the formation of the moon is getting a major rewrite. Here's what you need to know. Scientists have revised an earlier theory about how the moon was formed via a single slow collision between Earth and Mars-sized planet Theia, with broken off parts of Theia forming the moon. According to a new study in the Planetary Science Journal, the problem with the previous theory was that the moon shares much of its chemistry with Earth, not Theia, and that it requires improbably low initial velocity. To explain both phenomena, the new theory suggests an alternative version of events. Rather than hitting the Earth once, at low speed, merging then and there and forming the Moon, Thea initially hit Earth at higher speeds in a hit-and-run collision. 
and then, between 100,000 and 1 million years later, the two struck each other again, resulting in a collision that more fully merged the two. Using computer simulations of the massive impacts, scientists concluded that this version of the moon's history is a better fit than what is known as the giant impact hypothesis. However, this is not the only recent revision to the moon's backstory. Scientists have long wondered how life could have evolved on Earth if the sun's radiation flares were so much more powerful billions of years ago. According to planetary scientists, the Earth's magnetic field could not have protected living organisms around 4 billion years ago, when these organisms were supposed to have formed out of Earth's primordial soup. But last year, a group of NASA scientists took another look at moon rocks that were brought to Earth by the Apollo missions and came up with an explanation. According to the study, published in the journal Science Advances, the researchers found evidence in the moon rocks that the moon probably did have a stronger magnetic field back then. The researchers theorized that this moon magnetosphere could have been quite strong and that the moon was much closer to Earth back then, allowing for the possibility that the magnetospheres of the moon and Earth could have interacted. The theory states that the magnetic fields of the Moon and Earth could have combined to create a more protective magnetosphere around Earth. In this way, the Earth's surface could have been protected enough to make evolution possible. Similarly, scientists have known that the Moon has a tail, like a comet, since the late 1990s. But recently, they learned where it comes from and why it's brighter sometimes than others. According to research published in the journal Geophysical Research, Planets by a team of Boston University physicists, the tail is made of millions of sodium atoms that are blasted into orbit by meteoroids hitting the Moon's surface. These are shaped into a tail by photons arriving from the Sun. Earth periodically passes through the tail. When this happens, Earth's gravity focuses the tail into a beam that wraps around the planet and shoots out behind it. The researchers found the moon's tail glows more brightly during sporadic meteor showers, as opposed to annual meteor showers, which can make the tail glow more brightly but less so than sporadic meteor showers. The moon isn't just some far-off object, though. Its behavior impacts Earth every day. And in July, NASA reported that by the year 2035, every U.S. coastline will experience more high tide floods, also called nuisance floods or sunny day floods, when its rotational cycle will amplify rising sea levels caused by climate change. In half of the moon's 18.6-year cycle, Earth's regular daily tides are suppressed, so high tides are lower than normal, and low tides are higher than normal. In the other half of the cycle, tides are amplified, so high tides get higher, and low tides get lower. Global sea level rise pushes high tides in only one direction, higher. So half of the 18.6-year lunar cycle decreases the effect of sea level rise on high tides, and the other half increases the effect. NASA said the moon is currently actually in this tide-amplifying part of its cycle. However, along most U.S. coastlines, this lunar boost has not really made high tides higher than in the past. But NASA warned it will be a different story the next time the cycle comes around to amplify tides again, in the mid-2030s, because then global sea level rise would have been at work for another decade. Less dramatically, research in 2018 showed that days on Earth are getting longer as the moon slowly spirals away from us. Due to gravitational forces between Earth and its satellite, the moon moves away at a rate of 3.82 centimeters per year, causing our planet's rotation to slow, according to the study published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. Earth currently completes a full rotation on its axis every 23 hours, 56 minutes, 4 seconds, according to NASA. But researchers using astrochronology on geological rock layers found that when the moon was closer to Earth 1.4 billion years ago, a day was just over 18 hours. The length of a day has grown 1 75,000th of a second on average per year and is expected to continue at this rate for the next millions or billions of years. On the release of the study, The Guardian reported that the moon will eventually stop moving when it reaches a stable distance from Earth. When this happens, the two will be tidally locked, rotating at the same pace, with the moon visible from only one side of Earth. Of course, that's assuming either of them survive the sun's destructive red giant phase. Lastly, what's actually going on and in the moon is another fascinating element of its story. Last year, NASA for the first time confirmed the presence of molecular water on sunlit regions of the moon, indicating that lunar water is more widespread than previously known. The water was detected in Clavius Crater, located in the moon's southern hemisphere and one of the largest craters visible from Earth. The results were published in the Nature Astronomy Journal, along with a separate study that looked at how regions of permanent shadow on the moon could keep water trapped on the lunar surface. To detect the water, NASA used a Stratospheric Observatory of Infrared Astronomy, or SOFIA. 
Sophia is a modified Boeing 747 that can carry a telescope into the stratosphere at altitudes up to 45,000 feet. According to NASA, this puts Sophia above 99% of Earth's infrared blocking atmosphere, allowing astronomers to study space in ways that are not possible with ground-based telescopes. The origin of the water remains a mystery. In a press release on its website, NASA says micrometeorites could deposit water on the lunar surface. Paul Hain of the University of Colorado Boulder, who led researchers on the second study, said other candidates are comets, asteroids, and volcanic eruptions. Alternatively, according to NASA, the water could form as the solar wind delivers hydrogen to the lunar surface, which reacts with oxygen-bearing minerals in the soil to create hydroxyl. Radiation from the bombardment of micrometeorites could transform the hydroxyl into water. Previous missions over the past 20 years confirmed ice in permanently shadowed craters around the moon's poles. Before Sophia's results, scientists had found evidence of hydration in sunlit regions, but it was not clear if they had detected water, which is H2O, or hydroxyl, which is OH. The findings could have major implications if astronauts can access the water. NASA plans to send the first woman and the next man to the moon in 2024 as part of the Artemis mission, and aims to establish a sustainable presence there by the end of the decade. One other thing that could be investigated is if the moon's interior may contain water, which Brown University researchers theorized in 2017. As mentioned, water was previously known to exist at the moon's poles. However, according to a study published in Nature Geoscience, magma eruptions from the moon's interior billions of years ago trapped water inside tiny beads of glass found in lunar rock samples. Satellite data collected by an Indian lunar orbiter in 2008 shows that these water-trapping glass beads are widespread on the moon's surface. The Brown University researchers said those water deposits are the result of magma that came from deep within the moon, meaning its interior must therefore contain water. The researchers did not speculate about how much water the moon could contain. However, they said future missions to the moon could potentially extract water from its surface, which would open the door to extended stays. Scientists have long wondered how life could have formed on Earth if the sun's radiation flares were so much more powerful billions of years ago. According to Solar Science, the Earth's magnetic field could not have protected living organisms around 4 billion years ago when these organisms were supposed to have evolved. Now, a group of NASA scientists say they found some evidence that might support a theory that would explain this mystery. The researchers took another look at moon rocks brought to Earth by the Apollo missions. The study's results were published in the journal Science Advances. According to the study, the researchers found evidence in the moon rocks that the moon did have a magnetic field. Researchers theorize that this moon magnetosphere could have been quite strong and that it was much closer to Earth back then, allowing for the possibility that the moon and Earth could have had a combined magnetosphere. The theory states that the magnetic fields of the moon and Earth could have combined to create a more protective magnetosphere around the Earth. In this way, the Earth's surface could have been protected enough to make evolution possible. For more news animations and explainers, hit the subscribe and bell button to join the Tomo News family. Thanks for watching.